I think I'm early. I hope I've yeah. got a few people still wondering. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out to the Poison Pen Bookstore. It's always a real treat and an honor to have uh, Joe Landstater here oh, with yeah. us. There it is. Is this on? Yeah. Okay, that's better. It's a real treat and an honor to have Joe Lansdale here with us tonight, so please give him a very warm welcome. Thank you. You get two points for the Bubba Hotep shirt. <laughs> I was talking to Joe in the back, and there's there's so much to talk about with the new Happen Leonard book, and it's in some ways, you know, slightly different than what we're yep. used to with Happen Leonard. Um, a good place to start. Can you kind of tell us, it's no big spoiler, what the title refers to? Well, uh, Happ and Leonard often speak of the the element of surprise, only there's, they say, we got the really serious one, the big, the elephant of surprise. So it's kind of a joke between them. And uh, I just thought it was kind of a cool little title since it fit them. It's things they've said at least a couple, three books over the years. So, and, our, and we say it at home, it's what we always have. We, we have the elephant of surprise in our family. So I decided to use that. How did, how did this particular novel uh, sort of talk about the, the tone? Because it really just gets gets going right from the Yeah, beginning. what I wanted to do is, I, I've always experimented with those novels. If you've been following them, you'll see that some are, you know, they take some of the tropes of, of crime and suspense, and I kind of try to go my own way with them. And this time I wanted to do what I call a momentum novel. Meaning once it starts, it doesn't slow down much. It does have a few periods where it slows down and you're getting some information or they're at home for a little while but it's pretty much once it starts moving there's always movement they're in cars they're in buses they're on foot they're doing all kinds of stuff like that but it's trying to I just wanted to see if I could keep that up and I figured I'd go about 30 pages and I wouldn't be able to keep doing it but it just kept coming it just wrote it just that little book wrote itself as they say and uh, so it was an experiment, but I tried to also, I had originally had a lot of things I was kind of social things I was playing with underneath it. And so I went in and cut nearly all of that out, but it remains. You know, Hemingway, we were talking about this before, out, out back, was that he had this dictum that if you wrote something and you cut it out, you know it was there and the reader would sense it was there. Now, you can carry that too far, but what I think he meant is that by structurally, you can you feel what he's suggesting, and that's kind of what I like to try to do with this book. That was my approach. Anyway. And talk about the uh, the storm that the book yeah that runs throughout the book. There's a storm, and obviously it's it's reminiscent of the one in Houston a, a few years back. Uh, but when I was writing it, there wasn't that storm. I was about halfway through it, and the storm actually happened, and it just intensified the book because it. I thought, wow, that's weird. That's that's exactly what I was making up for this particular book. Of course, if you live in East Texas, we have lots of storms, but the Houston thing was a, a whole whole nother ball game, you know? And so I found that as kind of a metaphor for this uh, uh, momentum novel and all the confusion that was going on and all the mystery that was going on and all the misdirection that was going on in the book. And uh, it's funny, you can see my my very organized notes here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there's there's so much to talk about. I mean, one of the things that that I admire, and I'm, I'm sure you guys will agree, is uh, you write wonderful female characters, you know, and they they really they're all throughout the books. Thank you. And um, you know, Happen Leonard, uh, well, Happen Brett have finally tied the knot a couple books back, and he's kind of uh, assembling this family. Mm -hmm. One of the things that kind of runs throughout the books is this idea of family, not necessarily. By blood. By blood, yeah. Can you talk about that a little? Yeah, and, uh, you know, Andrew Vax often talks about this, too. And uh, uh, Andrew and I, we always say we're brothers, you know, and uh, we feel like we are, even though by blood we're not related. Um, but it's this whole idea is that you, know, you certainly the family you have can be a great family, but a lot of times the best family is the one you choose. And uh, that's what happened Leonard do pretty much. He does actually have a daughter that he didn't know he had that uh, appeared, I think, in uh, Honky Tonk Samurai first. And so what's happening is he's kind of picking up strays, is what I think. And these strays are people that pass themselves to Hap and Leonard, or maybe one of them first more than the other one. And uh, 
So I, I love that idea of these people coming together that are quite different, by the way, and finding some way to, to, to you know, link up in a logical, acceptable, and comfortable uh, family. And the one that's particularly memorable to me, you guys know the character Reba? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> she showed up, what, three or four books ago? Yeah. Uh, she's always steals she, she owned Rusty Puppy. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. Every scene, because she doesn't see things the way they do because she wasn't raised that way. And I know people that were raised like Reba. And, and so it is bringing that viewpoint. Because when it first comes along, you think, what, where the hell is she from? But then you realize that people are formed by their own experiences and what they, what they believe and how they think. And sometimes empathy is something that has to be taught. And um, generally it does. I mean, that's what parents, when they do it right, do is they manage to teach empathy. Of all the things you do, empathy is the most important because it makes you be able to look at other people's viewpoints and maybe not agree with them and not just their viewpoints. I'm not talking about their necessarily their religion or their <laughs> politics, but just how they see life and what they uh, have experienced in their life. And so that's what empathy does is the ability to feel what others feel. You know, there's some people that are extremely empathetic and some that are not at all. You know, if you go completely non-empathetic, then you're a, you're a sociopath. Oh, uh, yeah, or the president. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, that's, that's definitely true. I'm sad to say. Well, since Steve started that off. Um, we were that, just waiting for you that so yeah. to break the ice. Well, no. We, we don't see. have to go too far down that road, but let's go down that road a little bit. Uh, in the back, just on, on more general terms, there is a kind of a per pervasive feeling of, the, the, of, of paranoia. Paranoia, hopelessness, and uh, all the things that I don't believe you let own you, you know. Yeah. And uh, that's sort of the thing, too, is that they're pushing back. In the, the book, you have all of these representational things, of course. And, and if you don't know those things, it doesn't matter. It's just a great entertainment book, I like to think. But if you know those things, and, it's, and you're reading it in this era, it'd be funny if people read it 20 years from now, it's, it's not going to have that exact same resonance, but it'll still be... I think an entertaining book, and maybe it will. I don't know, but uh, it it has like a lot of the things I cut out still remain because readers pointed them out to me. you. Were one of them, you know. Said, yeah, I, I I think that's kind of about our times, and it's not just about Trump. It's about our times, which is pretty much across the board in how people see things and how people are affected by this constant sense of paranoia and fear, which frankly is created by all the news media. Uh, you know, you got 24-hour news, they got to fill it up with something. So you have somebody analyzing what the other person said and, and then telling you what they think they're going to say or what they feel like they're going to do. And then when they do it and it isn't that, then they've got to analyze that as if they have any recognition or experience. And that goes for all of the networks. You know, it's no different because they make their money off fear. I, I do believe, like, Fox is nothing but fear. And you watch it and you watch the other channels and... You, you go all over and you find this is a totally alternate universe that they've got. They leave out stuff that everybody else has seen, and you can see it. It's on film, and it's not, and they leave it out or they don't mention it. And I don't think I've ever lived in a, a time when we all didn't have the same base information and facts. And then what they do is sort of like, you know, the Nazis, is they tell you we're the ones with the facts. Everybody else is false news. <laughs> and once you buy into that, then you get angry if anybody disagrees with that. And I'm not one of those that thinks the others are ideals of, you know, uh, truth and uh, the American way exactly. But I do think that all of that has caused a lot of us to have this feeling of, of uh, fear and paranoia and uh, uncertainty. And so I tried to get that in the book and yet tried to also it in such a way that no matter what your political viewpoint is, that you realize that you got to rise above that, and you got to rise above manipulation. And I don't want to play that card too heavy because most of that's subtly in the book, but it's there because many people have noticed it, and and, and I, I thought it was there when I was doing it, but I didn't realize how much was still there until after the book was finished and I was reading it in Gallup. Don't you find, and then we'll, we'll get off the subject, but. Fox and the MSNBC, I mean, they're both essentially the same thing. They really are. They're the same uh, thing, the opposite ends of the spectrum. Selling a, yeah. Which doesn't give CNN a pass, but <laughs> it, it, 
you know, when I watch, you know who I want to watch? I watch MSNBC because they say what I want to hear. But that don't make it necessarily. But, but the I think thing, we all do that. Yeah. yeah, we all do. That's what I was trying to say. So I try to try to do all of those. I try to read, you know, things from the New York Times, the Houston Chronicle, or you try to read the Washington Post, and then you try. To, but you know, I skip all of these Politico and the Daily Beast and Huffington Post. You know, all of that stuff is designed primarily for one perspective. What's really scary is to read read the comments. Oh yeah, that's why I don't read. Yeah. You see all these trolls from all over. People we've got, and that's like Pat and Leonard have always represented two people that are, couldn't be more different who come together. And because we used to do that, you know, you used to have different opinions, but they don't have opinions anymore. They have tribes, you know, and I, I, and I do think it's the conservatives are the worst because they're the ones at Fox News, which they get. And, you know, it's a lot of times I, I've had friends, I said, well, what about, well, that didn't happen. What do you mean it didn't happen? <laughs> and then you pull it up on the thing and show it to him. Here he is, him saying it or somebody else, whatever. Fake yeah, fake news. And then you go, well, here it is on every channel. Fox just didn't play that. Conspiracy. Conspiracy. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just, just, it's yeah. just, just making a joke. Yeah. yeah. So there's no way if a person gets on that one side, because back when Obama was president, I was critical of him. And I, I voted for him twice. And if he was here, I'd vote for him again. But I was also yeah. highly critical of things. But I look at if, if if you had Obama doing what Trump is doing, oh those people, oh and you know, you have Hillary's emails. What about the emails? We have Ivanka Trump. You have Jared. They're, yeah. They they just recently this has come up before. People act like it's new, but they use their own private phones doing exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. lock them up. Yeah. I mean, that's then that, that'll be the next thing. And so to me. Uh, you know, I, I don't. I don't know. It's. It's just. It's. It is. A, it really is a weird way of looking at things. Because, like I said, I always think. Okay, I know where you stand for you on the right side of it, especially the extreme right. But put Obama in the place of the things that your man's doing, and that your senators are doing, and then tell me how you would feel about that. And then I love the Christian embracement of oh, no. Trump. I'm, I, I'm embarrassed for Christians, and I'm an atheist. <laughs> you know? And it's, I look at that and I just go, my God, he's wow. our guy, you know. And they're like, and they're like, you know, he he's sent by God. Wow. <laughs> yeah, all names on the Bible. Yeah, all the Bible. All right, we'll get on with other stuff. Yeah. Where was it? Vanilla, vanilla cookies and Dr. Pepper. How's that for a segue? Uh, yeah. Very, very important in these books. Where, where, does, where did that kind of little detail come from? I, was I had a friend I ran around with that was a vanilla cookie nut. <laughs> and he also liked anything vanilla, be it ice cream, be it sodas, whatever, vanilla. He wanted vanilla. And I just <laughs> liked that and kept it, you know. And so it became one of the things that uh, Leonard is fanatic about. Mm. I'm doing a collection of short stories about them called uh, Of Mice and Minestrone. <laughs> and uh, in that, you start to see that beginnings of that vanilla cookie thing going on. Yeah. Um, well, at this point, you know, obviously at this point in, in their lives, uh, one of the things that kind of has, has been in the last, I don't know, three or four books is, um, you know, they're, they're, they're getting a little older. And yeah. uh, especially half, you know, there's a lot about this this sense of guilt a little bit, you know, in the book. Yeah. About the kind of the damage that he feels he's done. Right. He's sort of the moral conscience. Right. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. You know, the. I think I think that's the whole thing. I think a lot of us who who write this, we're dealing with people that are working on the edge and are in many ways criminals themselves for, because of what they're doing, and so you justify that in that the other guys are bad guys, but there's also just the way you're affected by anything that you do that causes the death of a human being, even if it's somebody you hate, even if you think it's somebody that's horrible. You know, I mean, who was it? John Wesley Hart, I never killed anybody, didn't deserve killing. <laughs> well, then some of those people might disagree with that. <laughs> but, and Wild Bill Hickok pretty much had the same thing, but there are some people that probably deserve to be killed, you know, but if you're the one doing it, how is that going to affect you? If you're Leonard, it ain't going to affect you much at all. Mm -hmm. Even Brett, well, <laughs> they had it coming, you know. But Hap has a hard time being a judgment. He has a hard time of saying, I know the truth, because he feels like there's been times when 
that was not so true. And though it doesn't come up much in this book, I think there's a subtle mention of it. In the previous book, there's a, there's a killing that Leonard did that you can tell bothers happen that will come up again later because he, the guy deserved it, but he had a hard time thinking as a guy, Leonard just went out and picked him off. Mm-hmm. Just went out and fell, there he is, and picked him off. Yeah. And he, you know, he's dealing with that too. So I tried in this book to just kind of keep the momentum up and keep it exciting and keep it fun and save that little chestnut for later. <laughs> so uh, what, what is the, the inciting incident that kicks this novel? Well, they're driving, driving along in a, in a rainstorm, and it's, it, it's kind of intermittent rain, and they're driving back, and all of a sudden uh, a girl runs out in front of them, and uh, they have breaks and, and tries to keep from hitting her when... when when he finally breaks, she's gone over to the other side and they can't see her. So Leonard gets out and finds her and she is, a, she's an Asian albino lady, you know? And I've been seeing these pictures of an, there's an Asian albino model lady that mm-hmm. models. And I thought, that's interesting, you know? So I, I had her, um, I don't want to get too much, I'm trying to be careful how I don't, I say this because I don't want to give it much away. But what I would say is that her tongue is practically cut in two. And they rescue her and put her in the car, and then the people that are actually chasing her that she's escaped from make their appearance, and then things go bad. <laughs> and then after that, they get worse. <laughs> and then as it goes along, it gets worse. It's another one of those things where one thing is piled on top of the other. It's what we used to call one damn thing or another. <laughs> and that's how the, how the book moves. And every time you think you kind of got it, you find out a little bit more about it. But the basic, I guess, through line is fairly simple. It's all the other stuff and Happen Leonard and, and uh, these Dixie things. Dixie Mafia. That we, yes, Dixie Mafia, which is a real thing. All of those things are, are woven throughout. And um, her past is interesting. I won't say any more than that. I don't want to ruin the book. <laughs> well, and then the, the character Manny has a real star turn in this book. Right. Manny was introduced in previously in, uh, in the books, and she uh, works at the same police department um, where before Hanson, uh, Lieutenant Hanson, had worked, and she's sort of becoming more prominent in the books. And Chance, his daughter, doesn't have a big role in this one, but she's becoming more prominent. I have somewhere, I don't know if it'll ever get written, a book with Vanilla Ride and Chance. Mm. Oh. And uh, it's called Vanilla Extract. <laughs> <laughs> and if I ever finish it, I think it's pretty cool. They end up teaming up. And they're totally different. You know, they're, it's, it's uh, I guess it's a half a litter thing without it being exactly the same thing, but the differences are there. Right. Certainly. Well, I've asked you this most times you're here about, yeah. we talked a lot about Nacogdoches and East Texas. Right. Um, but weather, you know, right. we started off talking about the storm that's in this book, and I was thinking about some of the other books. Um, yeah. Uh, Sunset and Sawdust. Right. Uh, a lot, weather's a big role. Weather's a big place. thing, because when you, when you grow up in East Texas, weather is changes a lot. And uh, I remember when they were shooting the Happ and Leonard series the first season, uh, they were actually shooting in Louisiana, but they were shooting in Baton Rouge, and it's just right across, not far, you know, and, and essentially it's a line in the dirt. So when I was there, um, one of the people from Los Angeles that was on the crew, I think it was the very first day we were shooting, and my niece was working for me because I was doing interviews and stuff, and I was kind of doing book stuff at the same time. So she kept all of that straight and stuff. So she and I came to the set, and the guy said, man, I, I love your books. I read them all, but really, the weather couldn't be that shitty, could it? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, you're in Louisiana, but I said, essentially, what's happening right here is, very similar to, and I said, just just wait a little bit. Well, that day, and I was, it was sun was shining. Came a rainstorm. I mean, what incredible rainstorm! And then after that, a tornado came and took one of the tents away. That they had in the crew. And then a hailstorm, and we drove home and or back to the apartment in a hailstorm. And the next day. I came out, it was raining, and uh, I said, what do you think next? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, what can I say? Yeah, and, I, and of course, that was a special day. He had a rainstorm, a tornado, and a hailstorm all in one day. Wow. It's like Scottish weather. <laughs> well, is there is there a section of this book that you've been reading? Is it um, on the road? No. I have, you know what? I haven't actually read at all. Really? What, yeah, we always had something gets going, everybody's talking, and we don't ever do it. Well, it's always a treat to hear you no, read. I'll do a little reading. Yeah. 
Keep in mind, I have not read any of this at all, so uh, aloud. I read it when I wrote it. I thought, that's pretty good. <laughs> the night was dark, wet, and cold, and the rain was coming down hard. The trees on the right side of the road were bending toward us as we passed, and leaves and limbs were coming loose of them, tumbling in front of, of and against the car. I kept driving, dodging branches when I could, hoping there were no washed out sections in the road or a limb didn't hang up beneath us. The wiper slayed back and forth like a mean librarian wagging her finger at a loud child, and the lights bounced off the night. I kind of wished to see another car on the road, but most everyone else had sense enough to get in and out of the storm. Me and Leonard had finished up a surveillance job in San Augustine, and we're on our way back to La Borde. When we left, the sky was clear, and you could see the stars and the partial moon, but the situation had changed five miles out of town. First came the wind, then thunder and lightning. Finally the rain, then the wind picked up even more, and it began to seriously storm. I had the car heater on to fight the January cold, and it was mostly working. I was hungry and thinking about being home with some food and a big hot cup of decaf coffee, but knowing late as it was, I ought to just go on and go to bed and wait for breakfast. Maybe just a granola bar and a glass of milk. <laughs> or I might have some cereal, only one bowl, a small bowl. A bagel, no cream cheese. <laughs> Light butter, maybe. Might be some of that barbecue left over from the other day. No, that was too heavy. Hell, barbecue, that was nice. And if it stayed in the refrigerator too long, it could ruin. Better said, look out, man. I looked up and something ran into the road. I whipped to the right, just missing a bar ditch, and skidded to a stop in a spray of water. I glanced in the rear view mirror and then the water beaded side mirrors, but all I could see was the rain. It was somebody, Leonard said. Could have been an animal. It was someone, he said, a girl, I think. I drove up a space and turned in the road, trying to be careful not to end up too far on either side, as the earth there slanted down into ditches. It was wet, muddy, and steep, and easy to slide. If we ended up in a ditch, it would be full of fast-running water, and the only way out would be a wrecker, if we had cell service to call them. We were in a bad place for that, and I wasn't sure a wrecker service would come out in this. Hell, Noah wouldn't come out in this, <laughs> and it was getting worse by the moment. I got us turned around and drove slow, but didn't see anyone at least not at first. And then Leonard said, Hap. I braked and skidded slightly, looked where he was pointing. A girl stumbled back into the road, having made it across, then having decided to come back. She was waving her hands at us. Her hair was white in the headlights and was plastered against her head like a cowl. Some of it draped across her face, and there was something dark running from her mouth and down her chin. The rain washed it away as fast as it appeared. She was small and pale and obviously weak. She was wearing a stained t-shirt and pajama shorts and was barefoot. She collapsed in the road. Leonard got out and went after her, the rain hammering against him, the cold wind whistling into the car through the open door. He picked, picked her up like she was a doll and carried her back to the car. I unfastened my belt, leaned back, and stretched over the crack between the seats and worked the back door open. Leonard set her inside and nudged her to the center of the seat. With the doors open, the inside was lit up and I saw the girl was an albino and Asian and so small I at first thought she was a child of 11 or so. She opened her mouth and blood ran out and dripped over her chin and onto her chest. She looked at, up at me with pale eyes, not white, but a blue so thin they were almost clear. She had the appearance of a wounded bird trapped behind glass. She tried to talk, but all that came out of her mouth was blood and a choking noise. Leonard closed the front passenger side door, slid in beside her on the back seat, closed the back door, said, you're all right, we got you. Easy now, let me look, open your mouth. He gently touched her chin, looked inside her open mouth, said, Hap, give me the flashlight. I reached over and into the glove box where we kept a pistol and a flashlight and some odds and ends and pulled out the flashlight and gave it to him. The young woman was staring at, uh, starting to moan. Easy, Leonard said, just a peek. Leonard looked, and there in the glow of the flashlight, I could see his face change. Give me the Kleenex, he said. I opened the glove box again and got out a small packet of Kleenex. Leonard took it, tore the plastic cover off of it, pulled out all the Kleenex and said, Honey, you need to put this here in your mouth and close it gently. Might tilt your head back, but don't lie down. He put the Kleenex in her mouth and she didn't argue about it. He strapped the seat belt around her, said, You'll be all right. That's when a big black SUV came out of a side road about where the girl had first appeared and turned into our lane so that his headlights were pointing right at us. The SUV stopped and a big black man in black clothes wearing a dark rain-beaten hat got out of the car on the passenger side. He looked as if he could straighten the leaning power of Pisa, Tower of Pisa with one hand. He had a large pistol held down by his side. The tower gave him any shit, he could shoot it. <laughs> I said, Leonard, hang on. The man in the road lifted the handgun. 
first jam. <laughs> Actually, I have a request. Yeah. It's short, but memorable. <laughs> Would you be surprised? I don't think this spoils a darn thing. What, what from? Short, short chapter. Okay. I think you like it. When Leonard and I walked in, Buffy the dog licked our faces and wagged her tail. Chance peppered us with questions, while Reba sat in the chair at the table where we were gathered and watched us like we were monkeys in a zoo. She was a 12-year-old child, and she seemed way too wise and just a little evil. <laughs> Leonard nearly always called her the 400-year-old vampire. <laughs> After we told our stories, Reba said, y'all could have got yourself shot and for some whitey. I'm a whitey, I said. Another whitey standing right here, Brett said. <laughs> Make that three, Chance said. I'm not in that club, Leonard said. <laughs> yeah, Reba said, all y'all white except Leonard, and he's just an asshole. And you said she was real white. Albinoism, I said. She got them pink eyes? Light eyes, not pink. I thought they had pink eyes like a rabbit or some such. Albinoism varies, Reba. I said she's a very pretty girl or young woman. Frankly, she's so small and young looking, it's hard to tell. She might be 18, she might be 30. That's because she's a Chinaman, Reba said. They look young when they're 100 years old. You can take the girl out of the projects, Leonard said, but you can't take the projects out of the girl. You're talking big country, man, she said. Listen to all that cracker music and shit. You ought to put some shine on your black ass. <laughs> Leonard gave her a look that could have made a bear call a taxi. And hey, you ought to shut up before I set you on fire, you little shit. <laughs> Come on, Leonard, Chance said. She's a kid. Talk nice. Nah, Reba said. And she might have been the bear's taxi driver. <laughs> Bring it, cowboy. <laughs> I saw Leonard fume and perhaps consider how long he would be in prison for killing a child. <laughs> Last time I rescued your ass, Leonard said. Yeah, well, you get killed, you ain't rescuing no one's ass, she said. And I thought I detected a small catch in her voice. <laughs> Leonard relaxed. No way. Me and Hap, we're invincible. No, we're not, I said. <laughs> well, we're tough, Leonard said. Ain't nobody tough enough in the end, Reba said. Chance got up and came over and put her arm around Reba. They're both fine. Hell, I don't care, Reba said. She didn't look at either of us when she said it. I know what Brett said. How about I fix some lunch? You boys want coffee? That would be good, I said. Good, she said. I'll order us a couple of pizzas. Hap, start the coffee. That's not fixing lunch, I said. <laughs> it's my way of fixing lunch. <laughs> She tells you a lot about relationships. Tells us a lot about how good you are. Oh, <laughs> yeah. um, I wanted to ask you also about, um, oh, yeah. about these books by Ralph Dennis. You mm. hold them up for yeah. yeah. These are the first two, as I recall, right? Yeah. 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 These books were they were written in the seventies, and uh, Ralph Dennis wrote them very quickly, and they were. They were marketed like they were part of that 70s um, male macho sex paperback run. And they were called Hard Man. <laughs> and you know what they were referencing, right? <laughs> but they're not like that at all. And uh, I remember picking them up and going, eh, I don't know, maybe I'll try one of these. And, and I read it and I thought, wow, these are actually pretty good. These are just real crime novels, you know, private eye novels in the best tradition. They take place in Atlanta. They're Southern. There's... Um, a white guy, Jim Hardman, and then there's a, a black friend that he has called Hump, who is a former football player with a sort of blown out knee, but he's a tough guy. And they're friends, though they never call themselves friends. They never admit they're friends. And uh, it, when it took place, and one thing I like about it is it's not politically correct at all. It's of that era and it's of that time. And you feel like you're getting the real thing, not this sanitized version. And yet they're highly entertaining in the classic you know, crime fiction way. But when I read those books back then, and they, you know, they dated some, and certainly there's there's differences uh, uh, in some of the books from the other, because he wrote them very fast. There's a few things that he misses here and there, and some are a little better than others. But I love the whole series. And I wrote the introductions for these because they're the biggest influence on Happen Leonard. This is where Happen Leonard's, the seed of them came from. Now, you read my books, you read, they're, they're very different. But this was the influence. That's what inspired me. And I'd always say that, and people go, what? <laughs> what books are those? And so these are brought back in print. And uh, I wrote the introduction to, I think, the first 
I think they use it in the first four or something like right. that. And then they had other people that knew Ralph Dennis. And he was an interesting character. He, uh, the only interview I ever saw with him was, uh, and I know the person who did the interview, and I'm not able to think of who it's Richard, uh, I almost thought of it, but he found him in a, in a used bookstore. He worked in a bookstore. That's what he did. Mm -hmm. That and drank. <laughs> and he had written a number of other books that had not been published. And he had, I think he actually started out to be a more serious novelist, which is what a lot, I've noticed a lot of people like Raymond Chandler, uh, Chester Himes, they all started out to be these more serious novels and really didn't, they didn't look down on it, but they just thought, well, I'm doing this to make some money and it's their best work. And I think that's the case with him. I read a couple of other things by him that Taggart and there was another one, but to me, they missed the mark. But these, they have something and what they really have is you feel like you're really in Atlanta. You feel like he knows the places he describes. You feel like he's been to the places he describes. You feel like the people in there talk like people talk then and in that lo locale. It feels Southern. So I think that was a big influence and all of that kind of went into the back brain. So I was excited to get that opportunity. So the character's name is Hardman? Jim Hardman and Hunt. <laughs> <laughs> you don't see too many action heroes named like you know Frank Flaccid or yeah. <laughs> like that, like, yeah. Louie or Blue Louie. Yeah. One of the things in the intro, uh, and one of the things I've always liked about your books is that you absorb all these different elements into your work. You know, there's Mark Twain, yet there's Donald Hamilton, yes, Ted Sturgeon. There's yeah. all these different elements kind of come together. Right. Uh, and get equal equal billing, as it were. Yeah. Can you talk about yourself as a, as a kind of a kid and what you... Well, I, I was always out? kind of a magpie. Yeah. You know, I, I pulled things in. And it was um, not only with books, but it was with comic books and it was with movies and television shows. Uh, because a lot of the television shows that really impacted me weren't television shows in the, in the sense of what you see now. They were movies, actually. They were old movies from the 30s and the 40s because they needed to fill up that space. And um, Hopalong Casting was the biggest thing going. And they took all the old Hopalong Casting movies and then they started making new material um, about Hopalong Casting. People may not remember this or be old enough to remember, but you just think the Beatles were big. Mm -hmm. Hopalong Casting was huge. He had all kinds of products named after him and, and, and people, and one of the things I admired about him, it was a, a signing he did somewhere in the South, and I forget all the details about it, but when they, he was there for a, they were showing it at one of his things in the theater, he was there to sign, you know, paper and materials or whatever people brought up for him to sign, and they put the black kids in one line and they put the white kids in the other. He said, if you don't put those lines together, I'm gone. And they put them together. Yeah. Hopalong Castle. <laughs> so all of that kind of stuff influenced me. And I took in the Lone Ranger, and I took in Rifleman, and I took in Have Gun Will Travel, and I watched all of the Private Eye shows, 77, Sunset Strip, all that stuff. And then I read everything I could get my hands on. I, I read the <coughs> superhero comics, but I also read Classics Illustrated, mm -hmm. which got me excited about things like crime and punishment, you know, <laughs> things that a kid might not normally have been excited about. And uh, there were comics for every, just about every classic novel or even collections of short stories. They had one had O. Henry short stories and one with Poe short stories. And all of those things got me excited. And um, I went out and one of them had the Iliad and the Odyssey. I went out and read the Iliad and the Odyssey. And I started reading Greek mythology and I got really into all kinds of mythology. I jumped from there to reading Mark Twain. Huckleberry Finn changed my views on uh, race. You know, I, I learned lessons from that and from my, To Kill a Mockingbird. And, but I also, you know, I loved all of the genres, science fiction in particular at that age, and fantasy and horror. And uh, as I got older, you know, I'm reading Flannery O'Connor and William Faulkner and F. Scott Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway and uh, Carson McCullers, all of these different writers. And for me, I... I came from a, a, a background where my parents didn't think about things being good for you. They just thought, they're glad I'm reading, <laughs> you know, because my dad couldn't read or write. And my mother was a reader, and she encouraged me. And I remember I had I read Audubon's books on birds 
everything. I was a sponge. I, I almost read all the world book encyclopedias. My mother sold those door to door. So we had a set and I started reading them and I, I think I got somewhere around X or something. And I, and, you know, can you believe it? Three more. <laughs> and I played out. But all of that stuff to me just became the soup. So when I write, and I, and I write in uh, very different things. I, 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 was, I, I was telling you all ago that uh, I told Patrick, I, I've got a book coming out called Jane Goes North about two women that are taking a road trip and things go wrong. But it's not, strictly speaking, a crime novel. It's not a horror novel. It's, uh, it's got some interesting characters, I like to think, and some interesting incidents, but it doesn't fit in any of those genres. And then I have a very sort of offbeat genre novel called The Sky Done Rip, which is the third Ned the Seal book. I have two others about that character. And they're like a real small group that even know about them, but I want to write them, I do. And uh, I have um, another um, crime book coming called More Better Deals. That's not a Happen Leonard at all. It's about a used car salesman in the 60s. And he is a crumb. <laughs> He's as you would expect. He's a used car salesman. <laughs> My brother used to sell used cars. I never let him forget it. Uh, but, you know, to me, all I was like a magpie. I grabbed this and that from everything. And music, music was another influence. And even when I write now, there's a rhythm in my head when I'm writing, and I have to find that rhythm. And once I find that rhythm, then I can I start to write. The characters start to speak to me. Attitude, they become real. And when those characters become real, then I've really got it. And uh, I... I don't plot, I don't outline, I depend primarily on my subconscious. And uh, I, I, was, I was telling Patrick the other night, it's only happened to me once before where I dreamed an entire novel mm -hmm. in a night. And the, the other one was cold in July. Mm -hmm. But this one, just recent, uh, More Better Deals, um, I went to bed feeling like I didn't have any ideas and I was ready to start a new novel. And I'd been a whole two days, and of course I'm thinking, I'm all done. My wife said, it's been two days. <laughs> two days. You do this all the time. <laughs> and then I'll be laughing upstairs, and she'll go, you're not that funny. <laughs> but anyway, I went to bed that night, and, and I actually, the first night I went to bed, I had another idea that I was telling you about, Moon Lake. And I started writing that. I got about 30 pages into it. And then that's when I went to bed and I dreamed this entire novel, More Better Deals. And the characters kept coming and twists kept coming. And I thought, God, I got to get up now or I won't remember it. So I don't outline, but I made notes. Used car salesman, does this, does that. I thought, well, that's not enough because I, I can't outline. So I just started writing that night. So I wrote quite a bit, you know, I forget how many pages. But the next morning, I got up and wrote 70 pages. Jim. In one day, and then the whole novel I wrote in three weeks. Wow. You know, then I, I let it lay for three days, which is a long time for me. And then I I went back in and uh, reread it, and I didn't have to change too much. I had to do some, but mostly it was a different phrasing or a tighter sentence. I mainly cut, which is what I usually do is I cut. And when I got through with it, I said. Oh, Joe, this is delicious. <laughs> <laughs> then if you ask me next year, I'll be going, I wonder if it's any good. <laughs> but when I, when I write, I write like everybody I know is dead. I've said this before. and uh, Because I don't write for other people. I don't write for the bestseller list. I don't write for agents. I don't, I'm not interested in that. I make a good living. At some point, how much money do you need? You know, I'm getting to do what I want to do. How many people get to grow up and do exactly what they wanted to do? Not many. You got your Prius. You got uh, what's that? You got your Prius. I got my Prius. Got two of them. Oh yeah. Well, my wife has one. And I have one because we travel so much. We we have to have two cars. I got my house. I got my ten acres. I got my woods. I got my pond. You know. I mean, I'm all right, and I I'm I'm taken care of. So I'm not I'm not complaining because I like I say I get up every morning and I've said it many times. As soon as my feet hit the floor, I'm excited and happy. I like what I do. And uh, I've been doing that in martial arts all my life. So those two things have always appealed to me. I'm getting a little long in the tooth for martial arts, but uh, I'm still spry. I asked Joe in the back room, you know, I've always been curious, you know, what would be the first move you would teach a newbie? He goes, no, he almost killed me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's terrifying. Um, you've been doing it for 50 plus years, right? Yeah, I'll be 56 this October. 
and I don't, I'm only doing like one class a week now, and I train myself for one, so it used to, it was all the time, so it's, it's less, I mean, I'm older, and I'm, uh, I don't let them throw me anymore, and I don't, uh, you know, spar anymore, because I, I want to have the long life of uh, being able to have my fingers, and, my, <laughs> you know, and, and write books, but, um, yeah, I mean, for me, uh, to answer your question, the overall thing is I, I, I'm like a magpie. Yeah. I pull from everything. Do you have that, that kind of, for somebody like you who's written a lot of books, a lot of stories, you know, real serious body of work, do you have that attitude that I hear from some people, which is, you're only as good as your last book? No. No? Nah. Nah. I don't care about that. I might not want to write a book like the last book. It may be good in its own way, but so you... Sometimes it's hard to compare. I mean, the Ned the Seal books, I think, are great within their context. And I don't mean that lesser. It's just they're designed to do a certain thing. And if I can do what I design to do, then I'm content. If I fail at what I design to do, then I'm not happy. And, you know, that's not going to go out. And then sometimes you do something and you look at it three or four years later and it's you wish you'd have done it a little differently. Or you think, oh, my God, that's far better than I'm doing right now. <laughs> you know, that happens. But... I don't believe you should worry about your next book. And I have friends that are bestsellers that write great books, but I also have people that I, I know that are bestsellers who write the same book over and over and over. Even when I do Happ and Leonard, I, I had eight years between them, four years another time. And I try, as I was saying, I try to mix them up. I don't want you to pick one up and not recognize those guys and not recognize their world, but I want to be able to give you a somewhat different experience without you even realizing how different it is in some ways because you're you're focused on them. So I like to do it differently. I have several publishers. I have Mohalan Little Brown, which does, I started to say crime, but they also did the historicals. Uh, um, they did The Thicket. They did uh, uh, Edge of Dark Water. They did Paradise Sky. Um, so they've given me a lot of leeway. And when I want to write something different, I'm going to write it. And I'm fortunate that I've been around long enough, I know I'm going to sell it mm. nine times out of ten, usually ten out of ten most <laughs> of the time. And uh, I'll have a publisher somewhere. And then it sells in foreign sales, and they, they have different tastes, and sometimes different books of mine are even more popular there uh, in Italy or Germany or France or wherever. So. I, I'm living the life, man. I got no complaints. Well, it's no funny. Complaints. I'm sure all of you, you know, like myself, we have our favorite Lansdale stories and books. You know, I mean, Big Blow is one of my favorites. Yeah. I love uh, Ridley Scott's been trying to film that for years. And, really? Yeah. And then the Lost Echoes, I think, is a fantastic yep, book. Yep. Um, but you know, The Magic Wagon. You can go on and on. We right. all have our favorites. And I, I'm I'm a greater fan of my short stories than I am anything. I love writing novels, but Short stories are my favorite. I bet I've got uh, 400 or more. You know, there's there's these big volumes that are coming out in Britain, and they're limited editions. So I think there's only like five or 600 a, a set. They did one called uh, Cosmic Interruptions, which they tried to do the fantasy and science fiction stuff, and he kept saying, well, I don't know what this fits into. I said, just, just go for it. And uh, <laughs> then they're doing a crime one now called Blood in the Gears. And then next year is uh, Wet Juju, which is the horror stuff. And then there's one untitled that's more the historicals and Southern Gothic. and. That's a short story. Yeah. Stories. Yeah, all short yeah. stories. Well, some of them are, are, are a little more like uh, novelette or novella length, but most of them are short stories. A couple of them, I think I do both of them, yeah. A couple of them are just in uh, David Fincher's uh, Love, Death, and Robots. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tim Miller's the other guy with him. And then uh, an old one that I wrote with my kids got picked up by Creepshow, which is, uh, they're adapting it. A friend of mine, Matt Bain, adapted it. So it's all family, you know. So I'm excited about what that. What story was that? Uh, the Companion. Oh, Scarecrow. Yeah. It's a scary Scarecrow story. Oh, yeah. But what about, uh, you know, such chestnuts as uh, Godzilla's 12-step yep. program. Constantly <laughs> reprinted. <laughs> Tight little it stitches is. on a... What is it? Tight stitches in a dead man's bag. Yeah. Also constantly reprinted. Great stuff. Yeah. Yeah, there's those... Uh, the stories satisfy me more, I think. And I like the fact that I can write it and move on to something new. And I've always felt like short stories impacted me more. And I've always thought, too, that like science fiction, fantasy, and horror are better with short stories. Uh, there's some novels that are good, but most horror novels don't appeal to me. I lose interest in them pretty quick. 
And that's why I haven't written many of them. You know, I've, I don't know, I've written maybe two, mm-hmm. if I'm off the top of my head. Night Runners. And, uh, what's that? Night Runners. Night Runners and, the, and uh, Dead in the West. Oh. Well, maybe mm-hmm. the drive-in, but I, the drive-in, I don't know what that is. That's, That's just something for me. <laughs> Act of Love's a crime novel, but it's horrific. There's a difference in using the tools and it being that particular thing. I've written some things that fit perfectly in one of those boxes, but I've written a lot of things that don't. And that's why I always think of myself as write, a writer, not a crime writer, not a horror writer, not a Western writer, or whatever it is, but a writer. And so I get to do all these different different things. Yeah, sadly, though, the, the market for short stories has shrunk so much over the years. You don't have the outlets we used to have. Uh, you're right. But and for me, I, that's not true, fortunately. Well, well, for you, but yeah, but yeah. I was always the king of the anthology. Yeah. You know, I, I, I never sold a science fiction story to a science fiction magazine. I never sold a crime story to Ellery Queen or um, Alfred Hitchcock. I sold to The Saint a couple of stories and uh, Espionage, which was around briefly. And uh, But Ellery Queen, what, by the time I really, I tried writing for them early on and everything came back, you know, and it deserved to. They were terrible. <laughs> and I wrote for a bunch of science fiction magazines and they all came back. So by the time I actually got to the point where I felt I could write, I never had the opportunity to write for them because people were always saying, I've got this anthology. Mm-hmm. And they paid more, mm-hmm. and at that time got more exposure. So I ended up doing that. I'm kind of like, I'm one of the kings of the anthology. I did have a good moment today in an anthology. It was an anthology that I'm not in called Seven Deadly Sins. And there was a, a person who was reviewing my daughter's short story and talking about, my God, this is incredible. I can't wait to see her next one. And I thought, that's cool. That's, yeah, she did a short story for that, and and she and I did one uh, this that just came out and popped a clutch um, called Tremble, and she wrote a song for. She's actually a singer and songwriter, and she wrote a song for Tremble. And what we did is she usually John Carter Cash is her producer, but we did this one in Gladewater, and the reason for that is that when I swore I was born, and when I was growing up, there was a radio station there. I can't remember its call letters. And now it's a, um, does music production, hmm. you know, it's, it's a studio. And so it's still got the same look, and they haven't changed anything. The acoustics are real interesting. And Johnny Cash and Elvis Presley and Ray Price and Jerry Lee Lewis and Bob Lumen, who you guys probably don't know. But all those people were really hot in the rockabilly thing. Now that's before Elvis was Elvis Elvis. Mm-hmm. He was just that guy that played the Louisiana Hayride. And uh, they had the Chitlin Circuit, and Gladewater was on it. And they would come through there, and they would go to that radio station and play live. And the Jer- Jerry Lee Lewis has still got his name where he wrote it on the, a desk there. You know, it's still there. And uh, they've got little relics of when those people were there. And so she wanted to record there, so she recorded Tremble there. And it's for a film that I'm supposed to direct. So if nothing blows, we'll... And she, she gets to use it anyway. You know? <laughs> but I hope to use it in the film because it's just perfect. So it's like a Texas version of Sun Studios? It is. It is. Now, whether it's that good or whatever, I, but he's had like seven or eight, he hasn't been around very long, he's had seven or eight country, Texas country hits, you know. And Trimble's more like an old rockabilly tune. And uh, so anyway, but that's, that's, that's a connection to, to her and her short stories and my short stories. Well, I'll open up to questions. I, one that I like to I'd like to ask is about uh, is about um, Bubba Hotep. And, yeah, uh, I just watched it again recently. I it was it. on again somewhere. I, well, I've got the DVD. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, but I have to pull it out every couple of years. Yeah, it pops so up on TV a lot. Yeah, yeah. and I, I'm who like, dare ever thought that? This is the craziest damn story. It is crazy. Yeah. And I remember you saying that you thought uh, that. Of all your stories, it was the least likely. To be I remember there. telling my brother, I said, "Well, at least I, I know I've written at least one thing that won't be filmed." <laughs> Bubba Hotel. And I told him, he said, "Oh, you're right. That's not going to be filmed. First thing of mine ever made to a film." <laughs> Have you all read or seen the movie? Oh, yeah. 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 So, what was it like uh, uh, working with those guys, and what an inspired cast? Ooh, yeah. Austin um, Davis. Well, what happened is Don, before Bubba, Don called me out of the blue. And he said, I'm Don Coscarelli. And I said, I know who you are. You know, you did Phantasm. He said, yeah, that's me. 
He said, can I come to your house and visit for a few days? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> bring lunch. <laughs> and uh, so he did. He came and stayed with me a few days. Great guy. We had a great time. Uh, I gave him the bottom floor, which was kind of at that where I lived at that time. That was our guest room, and it was also my study and library. But anyway, he, he's, he came down to visit. He talked to me. He was trying to get the rights to the drive-in. And, and or dead in the west hmm. and we, we couldn't work that out I, I think driving was already option i think dead in the west may have been option and so that didn't didn't work out but we got to be friends and he went home and then he fought, found a, a book with bubba hotep in it and he he called me said man this thing is crazy <laughs> I want to film it. I went, oh, Don, Don. No, 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 brother. I wouldn't do that to you. I said, but you're not, you know, he said, well, uh, you know, I want to option it. And I said, well, you can talk to my agent, but I recommend you don't do it. <laughs> and he did it. He, he optioned it. And then the year went by and nothing happened. And he, he called me up to re-option it again. And I said, you go for it, man. I'd already given him his out. So he optioned it. And then he says, um, you know what? I'm going to do this. I've got a script. He said, no, you want to do a script. And I said, no, <laughs> not me. I said, I couldn't do a script on that thing. I just don't think it can be filmed. And so he wrote a script. And they sent it to me, and I went, damn, <laughs> good script. And I had a few complaints, which, um, you know, I think he eventually did correct a few things that I suggested. But then my son said, oh, they're going to make a movie, Daddy. He was young then. He said, Ask him to get my favorite actors, Bruce Campbell, in it. I said, son, I have no say in that. And a few days later, I got a phone call, and it was Don. He said, what do you think about Bruce Campbell? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> and so that was my son's hero for a while. And then when they got Ossie Davis, I was over the moon, because I'm was a, I'm a big fan of Ossie Davis's work. And um, so then they started getting ready to film it. So my son and I, we went out there for over a week, and we're on the set constantly. And, and I thought, I just don't know how this is going to work. And he showed me some. Well, one thing I remember is I remember seeing Bruce and Ossie working together. And I and Bruce was just terrific. And I thought Ossie was a little sedate, you know. And I thought, I don't think this is going to work. And then they showed me the dailies. And, man, Ossie knew exactly how much he was given. He knew it, he knew how that camera worked. And, and his, his performance was powerful. And that's when I really learned you got to look at this differently than what yeah. you think. And uh, I'd been interested in films all my life. I never wanted to be a director or anything. That's, that's happened kind of over the years. But um, <coughs> it was a great experience, and it was a great film, and it, and it premiered in Las Vegas. With, you know, Elvis played there, and, and so they premiered it in Las Vegas. I had seen it before. He actually played it at the Alamo Draft House mm -hmm. to a select group of people, of which I was one and my friend... Uh, Eugene Frizzell, and he said he was nervous the whole time because he said, I know he'll tell me exactly what he thinks. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he got through it, I went, yeah, that's good. <laughs> and I did. I liked it. And, and if you're interested in Don and his work and Bubba Hotep, there are um, two books out, one by Don called Truth Indie, mm -hmm. which is, and he talks a lot about Bruce and me and making of Bubba Hotep and Phantasm and all these people that he's known. And uh, then the Bruce Campbell book, If Chins Could Kill, mm -hmm. he talks about coming to Nacogdoches and oh, stuff right. like that. Yeah, but there's all this other information they have that for, for you that are film people, um, they're, they're terrific books for that. Well, and then I think it was last year or the year before you did another Bubba book. I did. I did one. I did a prequel. And we find out that Elvis did know these things at one point, and they were taken away from him. That information was removed. And it's a younger version of him. And it's a 1973, and it is called uh, Bubba and the Cosmic Bloodsuckers. And then it got, it became a comic book. Well, damn, the comic book did well. And, uh, and then they said, well, what, you know what we want to do? We want to do, there it is. We want to do Bubba and Evil Dead crossover. Mm. So we have an Evil Dead Bubba crossover comic. And uh, the first issue just came out. And it's, really, it's pretty awesome, actually. I'm, I was very pleased with it. So when you came up with that original concept, you've got JFK, uh, yes. 
the black man who's black had the, the CIA is yeah changed yeah. his skin color. Yeah, he he's, got the rest <laughs> he thinks he's JFK and he's a black man, and he thinks that that they 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 dyed him that color and that they cut a part of his brain out and they put a sandbag in his place. So you can understand why the other guy's not necessarily believe in this. And, uh, but then he thinks he's Elvis because he may be well be Elvis. And, and actually in the story there's also Dillinger, uh, a lady who believes that she's a Dillinger and then there's the Lone Ranger, Kimosabi. Mm -hmm. And so those things are in there too and they, they, they took the Dillinger character out because there really wasn't enough room for that. But, uh, and then you said, this story needs a mummy. This story needs a mummy. <laughs> I wanted the idea of, of some kind of specter of death that would be weird. So I chose the mummy, and I explained why there's a mummy in East Texas in a rest home. But you have to read the story or see the film <laughs> to get that information. Uh, but yeah, it's nutty. <laughs> Let's open it up to questions. I'm sure you have them. I've answered everything. Yes, ma'am. Why Dr. Pepper and not R.C.? Well, because uh, a lot of people that... Uh, my good friend Bill Kreider drank Dr. Pepper. And uh, every time we go somewhere, Bill is a Dr. Pepper. Mm -hmm. And a lot yeah, of Texas... It's made in Texas. Get, yes, you can't get RC anywhere. You have to drink Dr. Pepper. Yeah, well, that's another reason. <laughs> and, and, then, and then it's made in Texas. Dr. Pepper comes from Texas. You know, you know Waco, Dublin is where the, uh, there's a little town called Dublin that used pure cane sugar. Um, in there, they're the only place that does. But uh, Waco is the place where Dr. Pepper was invented. But I used to drink RC Cola when I was a kid. And I, I don't actually drink Dr. Pepper. I, li I like it okay, but I don't drink anything but diet drinks, and I don't drink diet Dr. Pepper much. I, I, I'll do the Coke Zero, or the diet, diet Coke. It's funny, my wife is from Texas, and she said when they were growing up, if, even if it was like an orange soda or Wrong. grape, it's, it's all, you want a Coke? What yeah. kind of Coke do you want? Yeah. You want an orange Coke? Or, or you want an RC Coke or a Dr. Pepper Coke? They were all Cokes. That's right. Clear Coke. Clear Coke. Clear Coke. Be all right. You get a, I'll have one of them chocolate Cokes. You used to have the place you had the little chocolate drink. You who? Oh, yeah. Well, it was before you who. Um, I don't remember what it was, though. And it was, it might have been, I don't think it was bark either. I think it was a kind of a local Texas thing. I don't know. I thought it was gross. Yeah, <laughs> I liked it. It was mainly water and chocolate. But, it was gross. Uh, there was also Top Cola, all that kind of stuff. There's a store on, on the way to Austin in a town called Hutto. And Hutto Hippos, that's their, 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 their football team. But the Hutto has this store that keeps all this old stuff. And they you can go by there and get... Uh, the Dublin Dr. Pepper, you can get RC Colas, Top Colas, all the uh, peanut patties that are this big. Of course, you still get those, but get regular old moon pies you, if you want it. There it is. <laughs> Anybody else? I think there's somebody. But yes, ma'am. I have a really long commute to work, so I've been listening to audiobooks. Uh huh. And you don't have very many. Of all of them are an audio, but one. They are okay. Well, at the library. Oh, <laughs> that may be. Well, you need to talk to your librarian. <laughs> Uh -huh. And I'm just fascinated with those characters. Well, thank you. I mean, just incredible. So I just wanted to see if you can tell me, like, where you came up with the idea of Shorty. And, wow. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Um, his character just blows my mind. I did a, I did a character with some similarities in an old Happ and Leonard novel mm -hmm. called Rumble Tumble. Uh, he was called Red, but... I didn't feel like I explored that character as much as I wanted to, and I'm not exactly sure. I mean, I wish I could tell Sometimes I can tell you exactly, and sometimes I can't. But Peter Dinklage liked it, and so he optioned it for film. <laughs> They're supposed to film it. Um, I think he's going to cut the... They cut the hog, I think, and they cut the accent that he has, the kind of, they you know... The yeah, uh, so far. They could have yeah, well, you can train hogs. Hogs are smart. <laughs> and it's not like, you know, it's not like the hogs, you know, giving a lecture. Or anything. He's, just, he's just around. Yeah. yeah, well, true. But anyway, the, the um, uh, I think it has been picked up for film, too, but it's one of my favorite books. I love anything that has Western or historical. I, I'm really a big Western fan. 
but it's not. Well, if you say Western immediately, there's people that their eyes will glaze up. But it isn't like that at all. I, I, that's why I always try to say historical, because it's not exactly what you. It's nothing like what you would think, you know. And then if you like that, you'll probably like Paradise Sky. Yeah. Yeah, I think. That you, what's that? I did read that. Oh, you did read that one. Yeah, that's my favorite of all my books. <laughs> well, try, try that spout, Deadwood Dick, sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Joe, you're you're pretty prolific. I mean, that, uh, I, no, I thought you were going to say I was pretty. I was no. getting excited. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, do you type everything yourself? Do you do, do you do any dictation? Do you have anybody? It's all. It's all me. Okay. Yeah, I, I I type it and I proof it. Do the whole thing. My wife used to proof it some, but I'm just so prolific. And she's handling the business. And if I have something I really think needs it, I'll give it to her to prove. One of the things that changed was that I, the computer changed it to where I don't make as many spelling mistakes and typos, and, and I'm able to revise even quicker. You know, I've actually gotten faster as I've gotten older, and I don't think to be fast. I'm not trying to be fast. I'm not trying to be slow. A good book is not good because it's written slow or fast. It's the person doing it, you know, and what you have to say. And uh, I have a lot that I want to write about, and, and I'm excited. And so mine comes out of excitement. The, the person who came the closest to describing it that I was always influenced by was Ray Bradbury. I, I feel it that same way, you know. He used to say, jump off the cliff and build your wings on the way down. And that's kind of the way I do it. But I never feel like I get lost or get, you know, in a corner or anything. Maybe for like a, a few minutes or a day, and then I'm, I'm right out of it. But for me, it all falls into place, but it's it's because I think the subconscious is working ahead of you, you know, and I don't consciously think about it much. If it's something that's really specific, like research that I need to look up, I do, but mostly my subconscious is sorting it for me the day before, you know. And it's just a matter of showing up. And you putting in the work. Yeah, yeah, yeah but you know, I, I have a deal that I have to get three to five pages a day. I have gotten more, as I was saying earlier, I've gotten 10, 15 a day sometimes for a few days, but three to five, if I get that, I feel like I'm doing well. Every day. Every day, just about. I hardly ever miss a day. Once in a while I do. And I, I work when I travel most of the time. Sometimes I'll take a little time off, uh, but mostly I do. And the last three books I wrote, well, the, not the last three, but the three, Edge of Dark Water, The Thicket, Paradise Sky, were all written travel through Europe. Mm -hmm. Now, do you you work on multiple books? Same yeah, time. sometimes. Uh, not all the time. Sometimes one book will take over. Sometimes, like I said, I was doing two until one of these caught fire. I usually have a short story or two I'm doing, or an article I'm, I'm doing. Um, but for me, when I come in, I I don't sit there and think very much. I immediately, usually just, bam. You know, I'm, I'm there. It's, it's The story's there for me. It's just like it's falling out of my head, you know? And uh, I can't, I'm typing as fast as I can to keep up with it. And I type really fast, you know. And uh, it's just, it's, it's an exciting way to work because I don't know what's going to happen. If I outline something, then I feel like I've written it. I'm no longer interested in it. I tried that. And I got through it. I go, why do I want to write that? I know everything in it. And, and even though I dreamed that thing, it was so hot. And I was able to get to the machine so quick after dreaming that story, it was different. But if I had lingered over that story for, you know, weeks and months, it would have just gone dead. I, I had one the other day I thought was a great story, but it was one of those that I think of as, it's one of those that's got the blooms on the rose right then, and I wasn't able to get to it. And I remember every bit of it, but it has no charm for me anymore. But as long as I show up, and I do one draft, and then I polish as I go, and then I do a one one overall polish, but I don't do a bunch of multiple drafts. When I started out, I did, and I just kept getting diminishing returns. And I find, too, that if I go over three hours, I generally get diminishing returns. And sometimes I'll go in and write three to five pages in 15 or 20 minutes because it's there. I go, that's it for today. I'm done. <laughs> and then other times I'll go, okay, I'll keep going. Now, when you turn it into your publisher, is that pretty much? Pretty much, yeah. And then, you know, the editors will give you suggestions and, and then the proofreaders. And sometimes it, you, you might have to do a little bit more work on this one than the last one. But I don't always agree with the suggestions either. So sometimes I say, I, I don't want to do that. Oh, that's a good one, you know, that kind of thing. 
But I won't, one thing I won't do is I won't rewrite the book. If you don't like it, write your own goddamn book. <laughs> and, I, and I'll write another one, you know. Because I know what I want to do. I wouldn't have turned it in if this isn't the book I like. But if you're making my book better, then I'm, I'm listening. But if you wanted me to write a different book than I've written, then I'm, I'm not interested. Unless they just, you know, unless they look at it and say, well, I think it's just completely wrong. And I look at it and go, yeah, I think you're right. Mm -hmm. You know, but that, and had that happen. Well, just one more compliment. Right. And I think 100 years from now, they're going to be teaching the bottoms. Thank you. They so already are teaching it. They are. Yeah. Because it's great American Yeah, and every time I think of that, I don't I mean to get on it, but my buddy Bill Paxton was supposed to direct that. And we really? had it for about eight or nine years. And and it, he died. And uh, we were about, I don't know, we were maybe a month or two from when he was supposed to start directing it. And I got, you know, he called me and he said, hey, Joe, he said, I think you have to get a different director. I said, what are you talking about? So I got to go in, you know, I got this thing, a congenital thing with my heart. I got, I said, oh, man, they do that stuff all the time. You're going to be fine. And, you know, we talked, joked, and, and he said, well, I'm really kind of scared. I said, oh, man, they, they do this all the time. And uh, we talked about how we were going to split up his goods when he was gone, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. And then just, you know, we got him laugh. I got him, I got him laughing and having a big time. And I think he called Brent. You know, I think he was calling people around. Just and uh, I said, don't worry about it. I, you know, I haven't signed anything with these guys uh, about that. I'm, you're the director. When you get out of the hospital, we'll we'll, we'll wait. It takes six months or a year. We'll wait. And uh, so he went in the hospital on uh, a Valentine's Day. And a few days later after the operation, I, I hadn't heard from him, because he usually would text her. I can't even delete the emails. I still got emails and stuff from him. Him and, and Bill Kreider both, and see, I can't get rid of them yet. But he would use his right, and I thought, well, I texted him nothing, I emailed him nothing. So then I went to Brent Hanley, who wrote the script for The Bottoms, which was a very good script. And he knew the family. I didn't really know the family. I knew Bill. We just saw each other, you know. and. He checked and he said he's struggling. And then the next morning he was gone. But there's new interest in it. But for a while there, I couldn't even, I couldn't even think about it. That's true. Yeah. On the bottom sets also. That's I know you don't have power on as far as audio books and stuff. But what, do you know why that one has never been made? It has been. Because oh. it's not on audible. Like that. Now it might not be on audible. audible. When they but did it, it goes back. They actually had the little, uh, uh, what do you call them? The little disc or not disc. Uh, yeah, they, no, no, further than that, we had the, um, real to real. No, <laughs> that far back. <laughs> the, no, 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 the, the little cassettes, what I, that was the word I was looking for, and there was a little box you would open up, and it had like six to eight cassettes, so it has been done. Oh, it is there somewhere. Yeah, and as if there's a, I didn't know that there wasn't another one I should, it's and they never did. I actually contacted them. Who, who did you contact? At Audible, they have a thing. To I'll record. talk to my agent about it. Also, uh, Devil Red was never done. Because right. the guy that was doing them was doing a really good job, but he turned out to have this problem with a, a, a younger girl. Ooh. Oh. And so, of course, he was fired, mm -hmm. and rightfully so. And uh, then another person took him over, but when that other person took him over, that one got lost in the middle of well, a certain a certain Jay Lansdale did uh, Sunset and Sawdust. I did the uh, I did the uh, uh, the abridged version. There was another version by a woman, and that really should have been done by a woman. You know. Yeah, it's good, but uh, I I I don't like audio books much myself. I'm surprised how much I do like them. Yeah, my my daughter. That's what she she does. She listens to them, and uh, this lady over here saying she a lot of people love them. I I start listening to them, and I and I get distracted and. Because I want to hear the voice in my head, um, and sometimes the writers that read their own books, unlike me, are not that good of readers. <laughs> 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 Is it a different narrator for all kinds of different yeah. than the other ones? Yeah. yeah, I noticed that. I noticed. Yeah, that. I think it was different from Honky Tonk Samurai on. I think. It's, you know, I have them all. So I listen to I the few, first few minutes of them. And then I, I don't listen to them. I listen to one all the way through. I can't even remember. Oh, I know the one I listened to. My daughter did. No. Okay. They hired her to do Fender Lizards. Oh, yeah. One of my kind of lost good. books. See, I that's that one book. of those I would have never read. I just That's one I never would have found time to read, but had time to listen yeah. to. Them, so yeah. It's like a story I got to visit. Just well, she, actually, George Martin hired her to do 
a short story that took place, uh, I mean, was told by a Southerner. And so, you know, she goes, she's been to his theater uh, to sing. He, uh, Janice Ian and different people sing there. And so she went there to perform. And so I think he thought about her voice and thought, oh, she might be good for that. I don't know all the details, but what's that? Yeah, Santa Fe. And so she ended up doing that, whatever the studio was, probably in Los Angeles where she lives. And then that got her more work doing others. And she ended up doing one of mine, which was great because she, she had the perfect East Texas accent. <laughs> and she could only do the East Texas accents, I guess. <laughs> the thing she did for George, though, she had to do two or three different accents. And I think because she's a singer, she can do that more easily. And, um, you know, she learns languages quick. You know, she speaks Italian from just primarily. She studied it some, but she listens and been going to Italy all that time. And I still, I can order coffee. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it. Anything else? Uh, so when you finish a book, how long does it take until it's out? Oh, it, it varies with the publisher, but generally nine months to a year oh, is about, so I, I, the one, this one that just came out, it's been, you know, a year ago that I finished it, maybe a, maybe a little less, maybe nine months. So how long until these three you were talking about? Right? Oh, um, The Sky Done Ripped is this fall. Yeah, that's, I saw that. Okay. Separated. Next year, on about the same time, will be more better deals. And then somewhere towards the next fall will be Jane Goes North, which is a favorite of mine. Man, I like it a lot. I have so much fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what about Happen Leonard? Uh, I, the short story collections Mice and Minister of Mice and Ministroni is coming out, <laughs> and uh, that comes out next year sometimes too. Uh, but other than that, and the short story collections I was telling you about from Britain, um, I don't, I can't think of anything else. But I bet you there is something. Oh, yeah. And then of course I told you about the Creep Show stuff yeah, yeah. and Love and Death and. Robots, Robots is on Netflix. Uh, animated. It's all animated. All animated. Yeah. The art is pretty incredible stuff. It is, and what I love about it is everybody's got a different opinion of it, oh, yeah. and they got. I hate that when they go, "That's my favorite," and then you know you're hearing all these different opinions. So I think it's, I think it's 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 having an impact. You know, I mean, I got I looked at it, and I I got pretty overwhelmed by it. It was just wow, this is <laughs> this is something. Lots, lots of lights and bells and whistles. Is it all CG? Is it all CG animation? Different kinds of animation. I've got two in it, and both of them are, are totally different types of animation. They did the dump and fish knife. <laughs> Stories of mine, if you might have to know. Yes? I've asked you several times. I can never remember. I need to write it down. But you read, I saw you read in Nashville and had a period come back in like 06, 07, a uh, story of a Smokey the Bear. You, Mr. Bear. Mr. Bear. Where can I find that story? Now, well, you can. Like, that was the it, best it's in, it was in, I don't know if it's still out there. Uh, uh, I think they all sold out. But there's Bleeding Shadows from Subterranean. is a big book of stories by me, and it's in that. Uh, it's also in that book I just mentioned earlier, The Cosmic Interruptions. Although I think it's it's not all sold out. There's still some of those. Mm -hmm. But there are special editions, so sometimes they're a little pricey. What's the that Subterranean? Uh, no, the other one is from uh, SST, the British publisher. Uh, but it's in both of those. And uh, it'll be reprinted. Yeah. Wasn't it in that Black Lizard collection? That was, no, that's the pit. The pit, that's right. Yeah, the pit. That's right. And that's been optioned several. The guy that did Helen High Water optioned it for several years off and on. And, and never got made. Then I got a call the other day. Somebody else is talking about optioning it. So, I've often said I want them to make the films, but I'm better off they just keep giving me option yeah. money. <laughs> every year you go, yeah, every year you have the option money. Yeah, go to the bank. <laughs> I got I got a nice royalty check the other day, and we were looking at it, and I went, you know what's really unique about this? I said to my wife, she said, what's that? I said, all this is stuff I wrote in the past. And it's I remember, yeah, I remember George Martin and I, uh, back in the 70s, were like, you know, sitting on a couch at College Station talking, we, how are we ever going to make a living at this? <laughs> you know, do you know where any markets are? And then uh, I was telling him that I was having lunch with him, and, and uh, he invited me over to his place, and now he's got people cooking for him. And he's got his minions, you know, and all that stuff. And I said, do you remember that, George? He said, yeah, we turned out all right. I said, you really turned out. <laughs> 
Well, before we kind of wrap it up here, um, there's some new people that I don't think have heard this. I always have this weird fascination with Joe's dad, who was like the ultimate badass. Yeah, he was. <laughs> Tell him that story about when you were in the, in the garage. Uh, yeah. I don't think you guys have heard I, this. If I've told it before, I'm sorry, but when I when I was uh, I guess I was about 17, and uh, my dad was pretty old then. And back then, you know, being late 50s was old. You know, mm -hmm. people got old. But my dad had been a boxer and a wrestler. He had li grown up in the Great. He was born in 1909, mm -hmm. so he'd reached manhood during the Great Depression. He had done all kinds of hard labor. Couldn't read or write. Was a mechanic, and he had his own shop. And so one day I came down. I forget we were going to lunch. I don't remember what this why we were doing this because we usually didn't do that because of the work schedule. But I was going to meet him. We were going to go get some hamburgers and bring them to the garage and sit around and eat them or something. So um, I came there and I I was talking to him and uh, this guy drove up and drove up in a big fancy car. Got out thirties. I, I I called him a uh, you know Apollo Red in the story I wrote, mm -hmm. but. He was like the big red hair and like a, you know he looked like a, a Greek god that had descended. You know, it was really well built, kind of a smart ass looking guy. And he came up and he said, "Well, I come to get my girlfriend's car." Well, I, I, and you know, I was thinking, "So you're gonna drive both of them?" But I didn't say. <laughs> but, <laughs> said, uh, I'm, "I'm gonna need to get it." And uh, my dad said, "Well, uh, you can get it, but you got to pay me half." of what you owe on it, or what she owes on it. And he said, I, she still owes me for the last time I worked on it. Mm -hmm. He said, no, she's got to have it. Well, I need you to pull it out the garage, and she'll come by and get it when she gets off work. And uh, my dad said, no, we're not going to do that. And he said, uh, well, old man, uh, mm -hmm. I think we are, you know, or something along mm -hmm. those lines. And it got a, a little tense, and, you know, I'm looking there, and there's my dad, you know, uh, an older man, greasy shirt standing there you know chewing tobacco and spitting it out he had a cigar in his pocket that, that was a, a, a it was a king edward you know what was left of it he keep the nubs and light them later and smoke them always oh smell off but uh, <laughs> this guy wanted this car and my dad no i'm not doing it he said well i'll, I'll just you're going to i'm gonna make you old man and he stepped in and i thought well, i'm gonna have to help my dad and my dad did a little skip hop and hit him with an uppercut, caught him under the chin so hard that I didn't know this could be done. <laughs> but he lifted his ass up off the ground onto the fender of that guy's car because it was parked right there in front of the garage. And the guy fell back over, rolled off, caught his shirt in the hood ornament, which was a swan, and it, and it, and it tore his shirt off. And the guy landed on the ground, or tore, tore his shirt, got landed on the ground, and he was kicking like he was trying to start a motorcycle. And his eyes rolled back in his head. And then he went still. And I thought, oh my God. I said, Dad, you've killed him. <laughs> and my dad went over and looked at him, took that little cigar out, put it in his mouth, that little box of matches, had always carried a box of matches, pushed that out, lit it. Nah, he'll come around. <laughs> and, uh, so that guy laid there for a long time. <laughs> and uh, we didn't go get hamburgers we just my dad went back to work you know because this upset the, the train of thought I was supposed to go get him and so but anyway that guy laid there I don't know how long he did not move I was convinced he was dead and after a while finally you know he moved a little bit, gets up tried to roll over tried to get up fell over rolled over again and then finally he got up and when he got up, he would have been hit so hard, he forgot he came in a car. <laughs> and he started walking off like this, this zigzag. He went out behind the, 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 the uh, oil bit shop and out behind a filling station. And I'm watching him. He'd go way over here. He was like he was tacking in the wind. And uh, finally, he was gone, you know. And uh, the, guy, the guy next door had the oil bit thing. He came out and he was just laughing. You know, those old men, they stuff like that was funny to him. You know? He said, "Yeah, we bet on how long it'd take." You know? uh, but uh, another time they bet on another one too. But I'll, I won't tell that. But, but uh, after a little while, a couple of hours or whatever, the cops came and they they pulled up 
and uh, we were just getting, I think we finally decided to go to lunch or something. So we'd come out standing and the cops pulled up and there was two of them. There was a younger one on, on the uh, passenger side and an, an older one behind the wheel that my dad kind of knew, you know. And so uh, they <laughs> I rolled down the window and he said, um, a, a lady came by and said that you hit her boyfriend. <laughs> And my dad said, just as hard as I could. <laughs> and he said, well, they're going to press charges. And you're going to have to come down to the station. My dad went, no, nah, I'm not going. They said, no, you, you have to go. And he went, no. <laughs> and so the, the guy got out, and they said, well, we're going to have to bring you. He said, no, I'm not going. Mm -hmm. So the guy got up, and he almost, almost got out of the car, and the guy reached over and grabbed him. He said, no, it's, never mind. He got in the car. They drove off. Never heard another word about it from the cops. But, but, that lady came and paid her car out yeah. and got ready to go. And I remember my dad said, bring it back if it gives you any trouble. <laughs> I think he lost a customer. <laughs> Probably never got the other money he was owed. She paid him that half. What happened to the Cadillac? Uh, uh, they came and got it. When, when, we, when he came back the next day, it was gone. Somebody <laughs> maybe her, maybe somebody else. All of the, you, you know, I, that's what I was wondering, like how, what he had in mind. But he, I know he wanted to pull the side and never going to come get it later. But what he was trying to do is get him to get, they had to get it out of the garage so it wouldn't get locked up in the garage. Because I figured they had come before, the day before, and it was, of course, locked up in the garage. Because sometimes he would put cars out to the side that were finished, you know. He'd leave the key in them. So your dad had a reputation. My dad had a <laughs> I remember uh, my uh, cousin Steve said he was down there one day, and uh, the guy that was kind of like the Dixie Mafia guy had my dad worked on his cars. And he came in and said that this smart ass was there with him. And he said, uh, the guy was saying something to my dad, and my dad was deaf in one ear because of, of uh, welding a piece of metal had gone in his ear and killed his eardrum. And so, he could hear, but just not well. And this guy was smart enough. There was a big fan in there. He had a big industrial fan. So, yeah, he couldn't hear what he was saying. And uh, he, for some reason, he decided he was going to make fun of my dad. And my, my cousin said he was thinking, oh. <laughs> and then the guy, that the, the, the Dixie Mafia guy who went to prison for a while eventually, he turned to that guy. He said, son. You best shut up. The Undertaker's gonna be wiping your ass. <laughs> and my cousin told me that. My dad never even heard it. You know? But I thought, I thought, yeah, that's probably right. It could have been a very volatile little situation. Oh, it could have. It's Gladewater, Texas. You know, back in the '60s and '70s and um, '60s, and um, was somewhat volatile. It was a different era, different yeah, time. I remember you talking about the Klan back then. Yeah, not in in that town per se, yeah. but in East Texas, certainly. Yeah. Is there a story in Geronimo's grave uh, in that collection of stories? Was no, it I basically? I wrote that for Patrick, and uh, he had an anthology that mm -hmm. he did, mm -hmm. and uh, the only thing was it had to have car based, right? Car yeah. had to be car yeah. based, and uh, I couldn't stick to the car that much. I think yeah. he actually wanted to put more and stuff about the car, and I went, no, because yeah. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't. The story had become so real to me, and these kids were so real. But I think they were an extension of the kind of characters that interest me and were at least cousins to people like in the bottoms, Edge of Dark Water, uh, The Boar, uh, All the Earth Thrown to the Sky, um, you know, characters like that. I, I was a reservoir of them, and so I, I had a great time. And all your new stories have cars in them. Hmm. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. All these ideas. How about that? How about that? He well, started to trim. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Joe. It's always yeah. a privilege to have you here. Let's give him a nice... Uh, yeah. So if you guys wouldn't mind just folding up your chairs and putting them against whatever walls are closest to you. Thanks so much.